This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbroadcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. And welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicky, and I'm sitting here in a house in London with Jess Perkins and Matt Stewart. Hello. 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 We're in London, baby. Don't I don't know how many times over the past three years I've had to tell you this. We're not in London, baby. <laughs> no, this time we are in London. I've been saying it every week <laughs> for four years, and we're finally in London. Baby. Yes, we are in London, baby, and uh, it's a suburb just outside London, London, baby, um, and it's lovely. Do you think it's lovely here. For context, we are halfway through the tour when we're recording this. We did our show in Bristol last night. Yes. We've driven up to London today. Yes. I did the driving. And you smashed the driving. Yeah, the car is ruined. Yeah, but <laughs> unless the rental company is watching, then it's. In which case, it's absolutely fine. What do you mean? Tip top nick. Could not be any better. Don't even look at it. If anything, closely. I've improved it. Yeah. I got under the hood, did some modifications, I fixed things. So. And you parked it so well, and we appreciate that because it meant that I didn't have to park it. Yeah. We would hate for that to have to happen. Um, but yeah, we're halfway through the tour. It's going really well. The shows have been really fun. Um, we've met lots of nice people and, um, we're very tired. Name one. Name one, nice, one person. nice person. Um, Judy. Okay. Really? Oh, she I was, was thinking, nice. I was thinking of Trent. Trent, Trent was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trent was really nice. You name one then. Scott was a lovely man. No. Sorry, Scott. Sorry, Scott. I thought you were nice. <laughs> Scott knows what he did. Yeah. <laughs> Scotty doesn't know. So don't tell Scotty. Mm. Well, you got a little edit point there. <laughs> Explain to new listeners what this show's about, Dave. Well, if you've just stumbled across this show or you've been uh, told to listen to it without any context, what we usually do here is take it in turns to report on a topic suggested by a listener. And uh, it is my turn to report on a topic that Matt and Jess don't know what it's going to be about. And we love it when you report. So, last night at our Bristol show, I did the report. And at one point, Matt and I had a little mini fight on stage. And a guy came up to me afterwards and he said, yeah, great report. That was really fun. But it's better when the Sass twins work together. <laughs> I was like, all right, mate. I mean, we we just made fight? a joke. I told you, I said that you talked over me when I talked over you. It was a it was a fun joke. It was a good bit. It was a good bit. Probably. We were working together yeah. to create laughter. Mm-hmm. But anyway, <laughs> my point was that when Dave does the report, Matt and I get to just sit back, relax and sass. And talk over me. Yeah. Okay, now we always get on well, topic. Well, I'll uh, <laughs> stop you right there. No, good on you. Keep, keep it up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We always get on to topic with uh, the asking of a question. Yes. Beautifully my, put. My question you're in the you- land of Shakespeare and you're starting to talk like him, I imagine. Because I don't think right. there are any real recordings of him. Do I not bleed? Oh, that's one of his. Mm. That's one of his very best. Now, my question to you. Me? Yes, and, and you, yes. Thank you. Now, I've been uh, I've been accused of doing a lot of reports and disasters lately. And I say, in for a penny, in for a pound. Here's oh, another no. one. Oh, no. My question is, which volcano erupted on May 18, 1980? 1980? Oh. Do you know this one? Was it in a film? I know uh, there were two films that came out about the same time. Were they based on real events? You think of Dante's Peak? Dante's Peak and another one was called... A Volcano... Get eruption or something doesn't matter. Where was it, Dave? Hawaii? No, it is in America though. Hmm. In America, mainland America. Ah, wow, La La Land. Because that's where Dante's Peak was filmed. No, <laughs> I don't know of any that recent. Hmm, I don't think I'm going to know this. No, I'm not going to know either. Well, I'll say the first. There's two words here. It's Mount Saint Helen. Helens, yes, oh, Mount Saint Helens. Oh, you did know it. No, I just I I've heard those words together. And but you you're not aware that that is a volcano. That no erupted. idea. I'm pretty sure that's a cafe near my house. Wow, that is a weird thing to name your cafe after. I think it might just be Saint Helen. Oh, okay. So this is Mount Saint Helens. I've added the mount. 
One of the first, I I searched. Oh, sorry, sorry. I thought you meant the difference was that they just took the S off, and you're like, oh, that's fine. <laughs> Mount St. Helen, <laughs> no relation. Yeah, no, this it's is purely coincidence. <laughs> I'd searched Dante's Peak and, and it came up with an auto filter and other volcano movies. <laughs> and the other volcano movie is called Volcano. Ah, uh, they jeweled I mean, it out of the box office. It's super easy for you to forget. Yeah, it's hiding in plain sight. Yeah. Uh, now, this topic was selected by the Patreon supporters, so we thank them for Ooh, voting. Thank you. It was a runaway, runaway vote, this one. Right. Smashed the other two topics, which I also thought were very good potential stuff, but this was the only disaster. So I. In a, in a way, if you think I'm doing too many disasters, blame the Patreon supporters. Because sometimes recently it's been really, really – it's been a tight race with the Patreon votes. Super close, yeah. So it's kind of nice to have a, a clear winner. Yeah, they definitely wanted this one. And these are the people that suggested the topic. And if you want to suggest a topic, there's a little link in the description of this episode. You can go to our website, do go on pod.com. And uh, I picked it out of the hat, suggested by uh, four beautiful people. And they are Roy Phillips from Boreham Wood in Hertfordshire. Probably not that far from here. None of that sounded real. <laughs> uh, Antonia Daly from Lufton in Essex. That's also not real. That is also not very far Lufton from here. Lufton in Essex. Lufton. Lufton. Uh, further away, Travis Alexander from Gulfport, Mississippi. Ah, Travis Alexander. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. There's a lot of Mississippis. Which mm. one is he from? Number four. Okay. He nearly got there. And finally, from Victoria, British Columbia and Canada, Darcy Williamson. Ah, D. Willie. Good Willie to D. have you on, on board. Mm. So thanks to those people. Now, so you guys don't know too much about this topic then, I imagine. If I you don't haven't know heard of it. No, unless it was based, one of those movies was based on it. Because I definitely saw Dante's Peak. The only thing I've seen I remember from uh, Dante's right. Peak is where the grandma sacrifices herself. Jumps into like a boiling water and because their boat's stuck and she has to get them to the shoreline. She jumps in and oh, yes, sort of waits towards the end and then she dies from what horrific legend. burns. What a Fucking legend. What a legend. What a spoiler. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry that I ruined Dante's Peak. <laughs> yeah, you did. From 1997. You ruined Dante's Peak for me. Well, how do you know it's from 1997? Is that true? Yes. Well, there you go. I remember two things about it. The year it came out and the scene where the grandma sacrifices herself to save the others. Fuck sorry you. To, sorry to spoil that. Fuck you. You've ruined my favourite film <laughs> that I've not seen. You but you assume she was it would be. It up. She was saving it up. I was for saving her 21st it up birthday. for my twenty-first <laughs> birthday. Your twenty-first was going to be a screening of Dante's. Peak. Yes, and now it's ruined. We should all watch it tonight. What do you reckon? Yeah, that'd be good. Or you've still got Volcano, Plan B. Yeah. All right, Dave. Why don't you fucking spoil that one for me? Uh, a volcano kills people. Oh my god, Dave! I was being sarcastic, <laughs> you monster. <laughs> Uh, the twist is that the volcano was inside us all along. <laughs> the real disaster here was Dave and his filthy mouth spewing hot lava, literally. Mm. Sorry. Literally? Literally. Oh, my God. Yeah. We are filming this as well, so if people go to the YouTube channel, they'll be able to see Dave literally spewing hot lava. <laughs> yeah, wow. I forget Evan's not here to, uh, <laughs> Evan, 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 to edit that in, in post. Okay, so Mount St. Helens is a volcano in the Cascade Mountain Range in Washington State. It can be found 50 miles or 80 kilometres northeast of Portland, Oregon, and 96 miles or 154k south of Seattle, Washington. I mean, I do appreciate that for reference, but it still doesn't help me place So, uh, top left. Top left corner. Great. And trailblazers are from Portland. The basketball team. Is, is that what they're named after? Were they tra- like lava blazes a trail in, in a way? No, I think they'd be much older than this 1980 eruption. Hmm, interesting. There you go. <laughs> History is fascinating, isn't it? To me, time isn't linear. No, you know, we're all, it's all occurring at once, and we're all like thoughts of our own imagination or some shit. <laughs> That's what it is. That's what it means to me. But I, you know, I, I, I think pretty deeply. You're a deep, I'm, deep man. I'm wearing a. A t-shirt with a leaf on it, I think. That, <laughs> that rings true right now. And that t-shirt is almost covering you. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, I've eaten and drunk quite a bit on this trip. <laughs> All your no, that's a brutal, I brutally not... public way of letting me know. I've put on a couple of kegs. But... <laughs> I could not see from my angle, so I was just like, what are you talking about? Let me just say that I could see from every angle. Oh, wow, okay. You could see right up my chuff, <laughs> which is my belly button. <laughs> Everyone's chuff is different. Yeah. Mine's my left ear. Wow. Wow. It's a beautiful chuff. Every chuff is beautiful. Yeah. In its own special, special way. <laughs> Every chuff is sacred. 
Uh, Mount St. Helens gets its English name from the British diplomat Lord St. Helens, a friend of explorer George Vancouver, who the city of Vancouver is named after. That makes sense. I didn't know that. George Vancouver. George Vancouver (laughs) sounds made up. It does sound fake, I know. George Vancouver. It's funny, I'm like, oh, St. Helens, obviously they've named it after some saint called Helens. But it was about. It was after some some lord. Some saint called Helens. Yes. <laughs> That's what you said. Yeah, multiple. So I thought they went. Well, we could name it after one. Yeah, Saint sure. Helen, but why not? Name How it do after you choose a favourite Saint Helen? You know. Yeah. So many good ones. Can't narrow it down. Yeah, I my favourite one is the one that ate berries. Yes, I love her. Mm. Not just because of berries, but also just her philosophies. You yeah. know. She had a can-do attitude. Can One of her miracles of her yeah. was uh, she was able to blend berries into a smoothie yes. before blenders had been invented. Yeah. She did it with her mind. She was a witch. They burned her. <laughs> it's a fine line between yeah. saying witch, yeah. depending on who's looking at you. Because, yeah, you go, no, I, God made me do this. And they go, mm, okay. Did he Miracle. or did the, did the devil? Oh, but we don't like this one. Mm. We want an excuse to throw Killer. her off the cliff. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's dark territory. <laughs> is it Under Siege Two? Dark territory? Is that a? Is that it? Yeah, it's the sequel. Under Siege. Oh, Under Siege Two. Under Siege One, fantastic. Film. Under Siege Two, also fantastic. Really? Yeah. Genuinely. That one. They're on a bus. They're on a train. And a train. <laughs> so good. Well, I can't wait to hear about this story. Uh, Mount St Helens <laughs> is part of the Pacific Ring of Fire. <laughs> Specific ring of fire, too. Sorry, I mispronounced that. Uh, that includes over 160 active volcanoes. Oh. And Mount St. Helens has a long recorded history of eruption, but also long periods of dormancy. For example, when it erupted in 1480, that was the first time it had gone off in 700 years. That Whoa. is unlucky for people who were there that day. If you're there that day. That's a one in 700 year occurrence. Do volcanoes give you much notice that they're going to erupt? As we're about to find out, oh. yes. Oh. So, basically, it would erupt, calm down for a few decades, sometimes centuries, and then erupt again before repeating the cycle. Right. Sometimes, but it would be dormant for hundreds of years at a time. Yeah. By 1980, the year we're talking about, it had been dormant for 123 years. Oh. The park surrounding the mountain was welcoming 500,000 people a year at the time, setting the stage for disaster. Oh, no. So, it's been dormant for 123 years but then on march 15th 1980 the giant beast began to show signs that it was starting to stir it, like when you wake up and your tummy's grumbling <laughs> and you're about to go off for the first time in 123 years yeah like that You've built up quite a lot by that point yeah yes go off queen Is that a saying? yes and you nailed it thank you queen <laughs> Our seismographs, which are instruments used to detect and record earthquakes and volta- uh, volcanic activity, were only installed in 1972, but within eight years, they really paid for themselves. <laughs> because these seismographs measured a series of minor earthquakes that indicated something was happening. Hmm. These earthquakes began to build over the following days, with over 100 earthquakes being measured before peaking on March 25th. <laughs> five, I was going to say five, and then I went with fifth, <laughs> with an earthquake that measured 5.1 on the Richter scale, which is quite large. Okay. Aerial observations from planes and helicopters revealed new fractures in the surrounding glaciers and numerous rock slides occurred. Oh. So a lot of activities kicking off here. Decent earthquake. A lot of monitor- monitoring going on, but early on there was debate in the scientific community as to whether these minor earthquakes actually indicated an impending eruption or it was just routine rumblings. Yes. So people are like, nah, mate, it's going to be fine. It's all right. Every, from, t- from time to time, you get a few rumblings, but it's not going to erupt. But other people are like, we've got to evacuate people. She's going to blow. She's going to blow, yeah. Mm. They're two very different views. Yeah, two very, very different views. I reckon if people were arguing over that, you'd go, well, let's go with the conservative. You play it safe, yeah. right? You get them out. You get people out. Uh, one of the people who believed that the mountain might blow was volcanologist David A. Johnston. Oh, played by Pierce Brosnan. Yes. Probably. And his mother sacrifices herself about 47 minutes into the film. Sorry about that, Jess. <laughs> you're not, though. You're not sorry at all. You keep bringing it up. It's like the op- It's like when you say you're sorry, It's like a, it sounds pretty sarcastic. It does mean I'll never do it again, but I will do it again. 
<laughs> but he also hasn't spoiled the first 46 minutes. Yeah, you get 46 minutes of enjoyment. Yeah, 46 minutes of really getting to love that grandma character. Knowing she's going to die the whole time. Piece of shit. Sorry about that. Well, it was filmed in 1997. She's almost definitely dead now. And <laughs> <laughs> well, we can take some solace in that. <laughs> that what you saying? She's always definitely really dead now. Yeah, does that make it better or worse? I don't know. Uh, David A. Johnson, he's uh, one of the characters that we'll, I'll talk about a lot in this in this piece. He was born in Chicago in 1949. Ah, uh, uh, the, the Windy, Windy City. City. <laughs> and in 1971, he graduated from the University of Illinois with highest honours and distinction in geology. His obsession with volcanology took him across the US and he later completed a PhD at the University of Washington. His work on volcanic gases brought him to the US Geological Survey in 1978 where he was assigned to expand the program for monitoring volcanic emissions in Alaska and the Cascade Range. So he's building up his CV here. Part of the aim of the program was to work out changes in gas chemistry and whether that provides clues of impending corruptions or not. And when this started happening at Mount St. Helens, David A. Johnston was one of the first geologists on the scene. He was part of a team of scientists sent to investigate the potential volcanic activity. And he's turned up. He's one of the people that says, yes, I reckon this is going to blow. And blow hard. <laughs> he didn't think it was going to be a very good time. No. <laughs> this is going to blow. <laughs> this party blows. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Let's get out of David, here. David, this isn't a party. <laughs> this blows. Uh, David is described on the United States Geological Survey website as, quote, Dave was unaffectedly genuine with an infectious curiosity and enthusiasm. But perhaps his most essential quality was the ability to dissipate cynicism. He looked for, saw, and thereby encouraged the best in all of us. Was. Wow. Yeah, I heard was as well. He dies tonight. Well, this happened 39 years ago, so he's almost certainly dead. <laughs> tonight. <laughs> okay, but I reckon... He dies in the in the eruption. Uh-huh. Also, side question: Was Van Halen's song "Eruption" after, uh, named after this? Yes, but that's another spoiler. Okay, for my report, and it was will... also written slightly before, so it was kind of a premonition. <laughs> yes, it was. He predicted a lot of things. Wow, Eddie, what a guy! <laughs> you know what I mean? Who's that? <laughs> he actually had. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that person from <laughs> pop culture who didn't know them. Also, their song jump. Ago. Their song jump was telling people what to do when the volcano oh went off. Oh my god! But if you put, all, put Panama was where they should escape to, yeah. <laughs> getting hot for teachers, something you could do in your new life. <laughs> if you survive, hook up with a teacher. <laughs> yeah. Treat yourself to a hook up with a teacher. Wow. <laughs> So Dave, despite being only 30 years old, he was considered to be one of the most experienced volcanologists around. He- Volcanologist. It's nice, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a nerdy thing. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> shame, 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 shame. He had actual hands-on experience with an eruption from his time in Alaska where he monitored a volcano of a similar type to Mount St. Helens. So he's got experience. Despite this, not everyone's listening to him. On March 27, 12 days after the first activity, red hot magma from within the volcano began to rise inside the mountain and came into contact with icy water at the top of the mountain. And when extreme heat is added to extremely cold water, you get steam. <laughs> is that <laughs> and that's bad in this case. So, well, it's got to go somewhere. Can you tell me quickly the difference between lava and magma? Is one hot one's Magma's hard and one's soft hotter? or something? Oh. Is liquid, that right? Hot magma. I'm guessing that's liquid, and then lava is like yeah, sludgier or something. I think maybe it's different layers. I don't. I'm not. I'm not a volcanologist. Okay. Despite being named Dave, the same name as our hero volcanologist, our favourite guy. Do you know? So you don't know the difference. I technically don't. You technically, technically don't. No. You just, you just don't. It's okay. It's all right Only to not know. Technically, though. Just say I'm not sure. That's you got fine. Come in a technicality, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and the technicality is not knowing. Okay, so magma has hit ice cold water, water and that has made steam. Steam. And this caused the peak of Mount St. Helens to suddenly burst open. Oh, no. And 6,000 feet of steam blasted into the air and a 250 foot wide crater, 75 meters, formed on the summit. 6,000 feet high? Yeah, it just went poo. Wow. The mountain was relieving some tension. Okay, I've we're, been there. We're going to blow off some steam sometimes, and I believe that's where that phrase comes from. Oh. 1980. Yeah, that that volcano had a big night out. Yeah. 
Uh, do you want to hear, according to earthobservatory.sg, yeah, what the people, difference between magma and lava is? Yes, please. Magma is composed of molten rock and is stored in the Earth's crust. Lava is magma that reaches the surface of our planet through a volcano vent. There you go. Different layers. Cool. You basically were right. Thank you. And, yeah, so lava is... Once it's out. Is, Once it, yeah, when it's out into the right. air. Into but the it is still... St- it's still kind of magma. Yeah. But magma isn't lava. Yeah. You know, it's like Not yet. tortoises Whoa. and turtles, sort of. Yeah, it's totally if like that. If that helps you understand. Sort of like how butterflies are caterpillars, but caterpillars aren't butterflies. That helped me understand. That helped me. Do you know what I mean? Thank you, Jess. I feel like mine actually made more sense. I think it did too. Okay. But good try, Matt. (laughs) Good try. (laughs) Um, So, steam's blasted through. Now there's a 250-foot wide crater on top. And people are thinking, oh. That's not good. Shit's going down. Smaller eruptions continued at a rate of about one per hour throughout March then decreased to about one per day in April until they stopped on April 22nd. Oh, they're in the clear. <laughs> great. Oh, great. Well, we can wrap up. This mountain's a bit of a tease. <laughs> oh, Dave. Oh, I'm going to erupt. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Everyone's like, oh, maybe we're safe. Oh, here I go. Just kidding. But just in case, Governor Dixie Lee Ray. Dixie Lee Ray sounds name. like the character in Parks and Recreation who is a porn star who turns to politics. Dixie Lee Ray. Okay. Is the character named Dixie Lee Ray on the show? No. It's similar. something great, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like turtles and turtles. <laughs> <laughs> turtles and turtles? Yeah, it's a bit like that. <laughs> uh, Dixie Lee Ray issued an executive order on April 30, creating a 10 mile red zone. Uh oh. <clears throat> around the volcano. Anyone caught breaching this order without a pass faced a $500 fine, quite a lot of money back then, or six months in jail, quite a lot of time back then. Wow. <laughs> did, did <laughs> yeah. Don't go in, basically. Yeah, but 2,000 lo- people lived around the volcano and local residents were evacuated and roadblocks were set up to stop people from getting too close to a volcano. Mm, that's fair. Lots of people owned cabins within the exclusion zone and many were stopped from visiting to their annoyance. Oh, no. I bet I bet some of them kicked up a bit of a stink. Said, hey, that is my cabin in there, you I see? I own it. It's mine and I can go me. whenever I want to. Well, possibly kicking up the biggest stink of all was Harry Truman. Not oh. to be confused with Harry S. Truman, the 30th, third oh. president oh, of the United okay. States. Oh, okay. I definitely thought that's who it was. Because he'd be dead then, right? When yeah. Was Harry S. around? You keep oh, asking no. questions. Sorry, Dave. Stop asking dumb questions. Sorry, it doesn't. I just think Dave knows everything. What's this? The 1930s is a guess. Oh, I love this. That Dave even even has a clue. You keep going. I'll tell you. Well, our Harry Truman, the Harry Truman from this story, was 83 years old and he was a World War One veteran. He had lived on the mountain for over 50 years and was a bit of a local legend. Everyone knew Harry Truman around sure. this part. He had survived a torpedo attack in World War One. Some of his colleagues weren't as lucky, and after the war, he lived in a lodge overlooking the lake, living a life of quiet seclusion. Oh, sounds beautiful. Sounds, so good. sounds great. It's beautiful. Why For 50 years he's gotten away with... Why wouldn't you want to just continue with... living that way um, and therefore just clear out while there's a threat? Yeah. You know? Well, his cabin was only three miles from the summit and right in the middle of the red zone, and he was told he had to leave, but he refused. He gave interviews and invited a journalist up to his cabin when people heard about this guy that didn't want to leave. And he became a bit of a media star. Oh, no, he Harry. Said that, he said the mountain was part of him and he was part of the mountain. And that without it, he wasn't able to survive. Oh, my God. He so, he stayed on. The mountain. He fucked the mountain. Oh, my God. He fucked <laughs> No, it. the mountain fucked him. Oh, that tease. <laughs> that tease. Uh, yeah, t- okay. So, but like, so what? You're like, if this erupts, I go with it? Well, no, he's, he told the press he doubted the volcano would really erupt. He's like, I've been here for 50 oh. years. It hasn't gone off in that time. It's not going to happen. That's but so funny. Even though there were times where it's dormant for 700 years yeah. on record. I've been here for 50 years. Obviously, it, it went off ages ago. Sounds a bit like the climate change people. 
Anyway, why'd I bring that up? Um, <laughs> uh, I just want to quickly, before we check in with our, our president, his plan was to get in his yacht on the lake and just sail away from the lava. He thought, I can quickly get on my boat. Lava will stop at the water's edge and I'll be able to get away. That's what do you plan. mean lava will stop at the water's edge? Lava, lava it, it follows rules. Watery rules. Jess, it's afraid of water. It's afraid of water. Oh, I didn't know lava was afraid of yeah. water. So if Magma's lava's not. coming, just get in the bath. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, much like that grandma from Dante's Peak. Shut up. Oh, no. Stop re-ruining that <laughs> film for me. Harry S. Truman died in 1972. Uh, and when was he president? He was president in the 30s. What did, wait, what did no, you that guess? That was my guess, but yeah, I'm Dave probably wrong. 30s. No, 45 to 53. God damn it, Dave. Get something right for once in your life. I'm you embarrassed. fucking loser. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> so he was a post-World War II president then, I guess. There you go. Uh, so w- that's our Harry Truman we've checked in with. We'll, we'll check in with Harry a little bit later. Oh, Harry. Uh, over the weeks, the volcano became headline news around the country and people flocked to see what the fuss was all about. Coming as close as they were legally able to, to watch and take photos of a real-life volcano. I mean, at this stage, they're watching a mountain. A rumbly mountain. Ooh. Yeah, but there's not too much. You, you can't really say you're right. Uh, this concerned some volcanologists who didn't think people were treating the volcano with the seriousness that it deserved. It wasn't a tourist attraction. It was something that could potentially kill many, many people very, very quickly. Despite that, people are flocking there, taking photos. People are so dumb. People are so, so dumb. That's what they're going to do. Climate change and the war. Like, we're going to start being swallowed by the oceans and people are going to be on the shores taking photos. Look, the water. It's right at my house. Well, Whenever, uh, like, a hurricane... Hits America. There's constantly people there trying to take photos. And yeah, like the film Twister, <gasps> where there was a granny oh, no. who got out of her f- boat, which was in the tornado, <laughs> and she tried to drag it out of the tornado, but she got eaten by the tornado. And then she got hit by a cow. Remember that scene? <laughs> and then Helen Hunt punched her in the face. <laughs> the cow or her? Both. Both. Oh, bad cow. <laughs> she was on a rampage. <laughs> Helen Hunt. She. Who else was in it? doesn't matter. Poor man's Pill Pullman. Pill mm. Pullman. Mm. Bill Pullman. Mm-hmm. Who I think is a fine actor in his own right, whoever he was. Was it not Bill Pullman? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't Bill Pullman. Matt keeps bringing up these questions. I'm so says. sorry. I'm on a real bad streak of saying dumb things. It's, I don't know. It's lasted my whole life so far. I've, it probably doesn't even need to be mentioned because I think that anyone listening or watching has figured it out by now, but... We're quite tired. So tired. We're losing our minds a little bit. In we're a good half, way. Yeah, in, in a, a great good, way. A we're having way. a great we're having time. A great time. <laughs> but we're pooped. But we have a day off tomorrow. So Woo! don't worry about us. There you go. Uh, a few people just <laughs> breathe the sigh of relief. Who else is in? Twister. Is Philip Seymour Hoffman in it? Oh, maybe. When he's young. I searched tornado. I, f- I learned the wrong lesson from Volcano, the film. And I searched tornado film. <laughs> <laughs> but we know this one's called Twister. <laughs> <laughs> it was out in 1996. What a, what a, what a golden age for disaster for disaster films movies, in my yeah. late, mid to can late you 90s. Just, can you not tell us who it is and give us a clue? Because I figure out... I, I, I was right. It was the person that sometimes people call the poor man's Bill Pullman or vice versa. I forget. But they're two people who get linked together and they're both named Bill. One of them, Pullman. Paxton. Yes. Is Philip Seymour in there? Uh, Jamie Gertz, Kerry Ills, they're in it, and that's all they list. No. Kerry Ills. Unless he was playing the Twister itself. He was. He's a method actor. Bloody hell, what a legend. Yeah. He was great. He was a great. Anyway, so people are flocking to it to look at about. Yeah, people are you know trying to see what all the fuss is about because it is big, big news, but it's dragged out for several weeks now. Then on May 7, eruptions started back up again and the, at the rate of eruptions gradually increased over the next 10 days. So it was building up to something again. Our resident volcanologist, David Johnston, discovered a bulge. Oh. Or in a... In his pants. He <laughs> was hot for volcano action. <laughs> Literally... <laughs> uh, this this bulge is also known as a cryptodome. Cryptodome. I totally like that. I like that a lot. On the mountain's north flank, indicating an accumulation of viscous magma at a shallow depth. Okay. So it's all heading to the surface, sort of pooling and bulging out. Oh, dear. And the bulge is getting bigger. The north side of the volcano bulged out about 450 feet or Whoa. 140 metres nearly horizontally. 
So it was like a big growth on the side of the oh mountain. Oh my god, oh, growth. Yeah, right. Indicating that magma was rising towards the summit of the volcano and pressure was building within. Dave Johnston interpreted this as, su- interpreted this as suggesting that Mount St. Helens could produce what is called a lateral blast. I reckon that volcano was like, whoa, whoa, whoa don't, don't touch me for a minute. Let's just have a little breather. <laughs> it's gone too quick. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Just give us a second. Hey, let's just chat. For a bit. <laughs> don't, no, 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 don't touch me there. <laughs> oh, that's something I've seen on TV or something. Oh, so he's predicting a lateral... <laughs> I just gave you nothing. Dave just moves on. Uh, yes, please continue, Dave. Because he didn't say anything either. Yeah, I was I was laughing. All right. Silently. That Sorry was a that. little too real for Dave. No, 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 no. Okay, 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 okay. <clears throat> um, I'm trying uh, to lateral blast. This is what he's predicting. <laughs> uh, basically, meaning that rather than erupting straight up, like you would imagine a volcano usually classically would do, or a bum. Yes. Well, do bums go straight up or straight, straight down? down. <laughs> so it rather- depends on where you're pointing it. <laughs> yeah. If Fire! You've, if you've made it to the toilet in time, it should be going down. But, but if you're sunbaking, <laughs> you know, and you've had a few margaritas, you're falling asleep, <laughs> and you're like. I reckon I can. I reckon I can risk this. That lunchtime burrito does is starting to make you rumble. And you, you do what you think is a little fart, <laughs> and it's not. Oh, it's not. It's a big eruption, <laughs> vertical. <laughs> Matt hates this. Sorry, oh, buddy. I'm well. You engaged in it too. Yeah, I did. You never do. Sorry. I got excited. Um. So usually a volcano would go straight up, and then straight back down. Terrifying. Back into the same hole. That's no, well, down the, down, yeah, yeah, it's it like it's self it cleaning. It's like a like a, a water feature. <laughs> that's the sound of a volcano. Yeah, that's what I do with my butt as well. <laughs> Suck it back in. <laughs> that's so. Seal awful. it all up. Don't think about that too much. <laughs> uh, rather than going straight up, a lateral blast means it might explode sideways, meaning the blast would be much bigger in one direction. Do you know what I mean? So rather than going straight up and down, it explodes sideways and then one side just gets absolutely covered in okay, uh, you know, yeah, lava, yeah. ash, everything is in one direction. That's what he's worried about. One of the only other people to back up Johnson's theory was prof- a professor called Jack Hyde. Hyde was also of the opinion that because the mountain lacked vents to release pressure, he thought the mountain would just keep building in pressure until it erupted. David thought of it as a time bomb ready to go off. Oh, dear. He gave many TV and radio interviews trying to warn people of the possible danger. Johnston was really instrumental in getting the exclusion zone put in place, but he thought it should be much larger. Mm. He described the situation to the press as, quote, being on the mountain was like standing next to a dynamite keg and the fuse is lit. Oh, that's scary. It's so funny how he... He would have. He got it made, and they go. Well, let's compromise. You want to save people's lives this far out? Yeah. Let's save them to here. And we'll, <laughs> so why are we compromising on this? Let's be safe. Let's be super safe because they're all thinking, if it does go blast straight up and back down, the exclusion zone is is fine. Right. It's never going to get further than that. But if it explodes in one one direction, laterally sideways, it's going to be a problem. And the further out they make the exclusion zone, the more people they have to evacuate and the yeah. more hotels they have to pay for. More of a hullabaloo. Yeah. Ugh, such a fuss. And that might cost votes. Yeah. Can't have that. Now, sadly, Johnston and Professor Hyde would both be proven right. Oh, uh, no. By this point, a total of 10,000 earthquakes had been recorded around the mountain. That's so many earthquakes. Yeah. And they were building up to something and so was this bulge I told you about. At this point, the bulge on the top was growing at a rate of 5 to 8 feet or 1.5 to 2.4 metres per day. So they're aware of this bulge? Yeah, they found the bulge. That's clearly the way it's going to blast. Is that right? Yeah. And you're not even a volcanologist (laughs) and you get it. But a lot of other people are like, nah, mate, don't worry about it. Who are these people, though? And also, David Johnson's been brought in as probably the biggest expert they've got and he said and they're not listening to him they're like nah we've ex- we've done a small exclusion zone we've called it a red zone i'm taking it seriously this feels like something we do all the time yeah <laughs> and then regret later again people are really dumb uh, despite the order to stay away many people were inside the exclusion zone on may 18th 1980 a fateful fateful day some of the people inside included Harry Truman, the World War One veteran that refused to leave that I mentioned earlier. He of was course. at home in his cabin. Well, he's got his boat ready. He's ready to go. 
Another guy there was Reed Blackburn, who was a photographer who was very close to the summit. At 27 years old, he had been married less than a year after meeting his wife, Faye, who also worked at the newspaper that had hired him. A real outdoor enthusiast, he was assigned by the local newspaper, the Columbian, and also National Geographic to take photos of the changing mountain. He camped there 24-7 to make sure he was ready to snap the best shot when it inevitably began to erupt. <laughs> he camped inside the red zone to capture it when it blasted. Yep. Did he have and then magma what? proof <laughs> photos? No. <laughs> magma proof film? film and camera and head <laughs> and body. What, yeah, what, he's a magma what's, man. What's your getaway plan there? What's your conti- like how what do you mean? Get in the station wagon and gun it. So basically, if all things go right, he gets to take photos of the thing that's about to kill him. If it doesn't happen, then the exclusion zone didn't matter. Doesn't seem to make sense to me. Why doesn't he go... He should be hiring a helicopter and flying, you know... Now, that makes more sense. Yeah, 24-7. He should be in a helicopter 24-7. Get a better lens that you can take photos from far away. I'd spend money on a long lens. And I mean, live. They're able to get like naked photos of the royals from like 12 miles away with those what? lenses when they're on like holidays in Greece and stuff. Are they? Yeah. There's <laughs> naked photos of the royals. Queen Lizzie. No, I, th- I think uh, someone got in real trouble with Kate Middleton a few years ago. In, she was on a holiday in Greece and, you know, someone's camped out on a dirt road 12 miles away or something with a, one of those You're crazy lenses. you kidding. Yeah. Imagine like, that far away, every millimetre you move it, yeah. it would move like a kilometre across. <laughs> yeah. That would be so hard to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a real well, skill, it's, it's a real, okay. it's a real oh. skill in being a perf. That's the moon. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, no, I didn't want to see her bum. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> oh, that's the moon. Too far, too far. Too far. Oh, overcorrected. That's my. That's the ground underneath my feet. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, I can yeah, just get a happy medium there. So he was stationed at uh, Cold Water One. <laughs> that is a funny name. I'm still laughing at Matt's photography. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> looking behind me now. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm looking at the Hubble Space Center. <laughs> Oop. Oop, alien. Oop. I don't want to take a photo of that. <laughs> oh, it's inside my brain somehow. <laughs> I want to see Kate Middleton. <laughs> I just want a nude of a woman. <laughs> Getting everything but. It's like, no, just the but. <laughs> Getting so much good stuff, but it's not what I need. Just go on Google, mate. <laughs> so many nudes. <laughs> Uh, so this bloke, uh. our photographer, <laughs> yes, he's camped uh, at a place called Cold Water One, which is uh, about eight miles from the summit. He was uh, assigned to stay on covering the mountain until May 17, but opted to stay a few days longer. So remember, I'm talking about this is May 18, the fateful day. Uh. He was actually supposed to go home the day before, but he extend- extended his... Uh, his day, and that was a fateful choice, Dave, yes. as you know from this trip, I don't understand miles. So how far away would he be from the top in kilometres, please? Oh, 12k or so? Yep, got it. Thank you. Ish. Not that far. He's pretty close. Keith Ronholm was a geophysics student who bluffed his way past roadblocks and parked at a place called Bear Meadow, 11 miles from the summit. So he's a bit further away. These are all people that I'm going to check in with later after the volcano goes off. If the off. bears don't get them, the lava will. <laughs> They're the two. The two Honestly, dangers. I mean, I guess if you're like, I'm, I don't care. I'm just going to camp near a volcano. I'm happy to stay in the bear house or whatever. Bear village. Or what was it called? The bear, <laughs> bear, bear, bear village. Who's was in bear village? Bear village. Oh, hopefully they're friendly. I mean. They they run a lovely bear and bee. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Did that make any sense? Bear, the, the, bear, the B&B in this Air case B&B, stands for bear. Bear B&B. <laughs> bear B&B. Bear B&B. Bear. <laughs> so it's like that That would bear be the equivalent of, of us being beds <laughs> and staying in a B&B. <laughs> the bears, yeah, they stay, in a, they stay in a bear and bear. Okay, a bear B&B. Like Air B&B. Okay, a that's, bear yeah, B&B. that's something. Because we're like air. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's but this is a B&B for bears. 
I reckon in this bear meadow, the bears are probably smart enough to leave. They heated the warnings. Yeah, if you, well, if the bears start to leave, get the hell out. Yeah. That's what yeah, I always say. You know say. ants always know when it's going to rain or yeah, whatever? Yeah, rats always leave a ship <laughs> at some point. You know, it's like one of these things. It's like totals and totals. <laughs> Taters and totals? Yeah. <laughs> but you laughed at me at air, bear and bee. I was just trying something. Yeah, it was You can't great. even I say tortoise. It. What do you? What is that word you're saying? Oh my god, Dave, do go on. All right, so we've got uh, that's Keith Ronholm. Tortoise. He's pretty close. He's a he's a student. He's jumped past the roadblocks. He's bluffed his way through. He should not be there, but he's there. He bluffed. It doesn't feel like What's this is going to end, end well for him because he's a geophysics student. I think that he was telling them that oh, I've got I've got to monitor some stuff. I'm allowed to be here. Do you say oh, um, I've got to check out the CBUs on the BFHs? And the sheriff is like, I'm so bored. Just go. <laughs> you just, I don't just care. Go, I, I hope you don't. Go, please. <laughs> yeah. Don't come. Don't come I back. hope you're not supposed to be here. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's the people who have that need to get close to the action, putting that knowing they're putting their lives on the line. But I, they mustn't really think they're putting their lives on the no, line. No, they most everyone in this situation thinks they're going to be able to get in a car and get away. Right. Fuck. Oh, this sucks. And we're going to find out if that's true. Oh, okay. Robert Landsberg was also there. He's another photographer. A bit older. He's 48-year-old photographer. Robert Landsberg, just a few miles from the summit on May 18th. Yeah. He's very, very close. He had visited the exclusion zone several times in the weeks leading up to that date. So he'd come in, take some photos, go home, did this many times. On Saturday evening, May 17, the night before, that fateful day, Robert camped near the volcano and wrote in his journal, quote, feel right on the verge of something, end quote. He was masturbating at the time. <laughs> he was edging <laughs> towards success. I'm so close right so now. So to speak. Um, he, he took a little break to journal. Um, he said, oh, he's saying to himself, yeah. oh, no, 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 Okay, so he's he's camped over on the wrong night. Yeah, he's the, going home until then. Yeah, because he wasn't there all the time. He just happens to be there on this night. Uh, the following morning, Robert woke early and drove a bit farther up the road, stopping less than four miles west of the volcano summit. So he's very close. Once there, he put his camera on a tripod, and not knowing what he was about to capture. Wow. He also his journal survived. That's a good sign that he would have. If lava's going to take a humor, it's going to take a piece of paper. Hmm. Or is paper lava proof? Yeah, paper's lava proof, but people aren't lava proof. Right. Hmm. We conduct lava. Is that true? That's true. We're lava conductors. Huh. (laughs) (laughs) If only we could conduct it to go away. Yeah, go away, lava. Hey, Hey, you get out of here. Get out of here, lava. You chase it off with a broom. Get out of here. (laughs) You sweep it away. So that's Robert Landsberg. And, of course, David Johnston, our friend, was... Uh, stationed at the observation post Coldwater 2, six miles from the mountain's summit. He knew that in order to understand volcanoes and to protect the public, sometimes scientists had to put themselves at risk. But on May 18, he wasn't even supposed to be there. Harry Glicken, who was another volcanologist that looked upon David as as his mentor and advisor, had been working for six days straight, and David agreed to cover Glicken on May 18th. Finger Glicken good. <laughs> <laughs> that was worth interrupting you. Finger Thank Glicken you. good. <laughs> so he'd, had, he'd worked Volcano six days. Volcano uh, going to have a day off. And David agreed to cover Glicken on May 18th so that Glicken could attend an academic interview that he was invited to. Oh, attend. okay. So he wasn't even taking a day off. No. But a, way, a day away from the mountain. Right. That means Glicken's he's off. He's safe. He's left. Just 13 hours before the eruption, Glicken, as they're swapping over, took a photo of David sitting on a camping chair with his feet up on a log and smiling at the camera. And this would become an iconic photo. Oh, no, because it was the last one ever taken. Just 13 hours before the eruption. Yeah, 13 hours before the last I mean, photo Glicken ever said, taken. Thank you to his mentor, David. Oh, he God, left the mountain. this is a final oh, goodbye. David was his mentor. Mm. No, David. Dave, why are you telling us a sad story? Well, it's finger glicking good. I it think we can all agree. It is finger glicking good. <laughs> and I don't regret that joke at all. On uh, May 16 and 17, the smaller options had stopped. This would turn out to be the calm before the storm. But of course, people don't know this. Looking back, there's been a lot of signs. David Johnson has been talking about these signs, but no one knows this precise date it's going to go off. It's, this has been a, a couple of month long process by this point. Right. So, yeah. Mm. And no one would ever be really expecting it. No, r- not right. I reckon it's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. You yeah. can't 
you can't Especially when it quiets down, you'd be like, oh, maybe it's a false alarm. Yeah, because... Uh, but as you said, like it's better safe than sorry. But imagine if this went on for months and months and mm. months and it never yeah. went off. You'd feel a bit like, oh, sorry, we kicked you out of your houses. Yeah. But on the morning of May 18 at 8.32 a.m., which is a Sunday morning, an earthquake measuring a large 5.1 on the Richter scale triggered a gigantic landslide on the mountain's north face. It was the largest landslide in history and it removed a mile-wide chunk of the north face. Oh, my God. So a mile across of the mountain just went, and just started sliding down the hill. This slope fell away in an avalanche and caused what David Johnston had warned of all along, a massive lateral blast that exploded out sideways and carried a high-velocity cloud of superheated ash and stone outward some 15 miles Whoa. or 25 kilometres from the volcano summit, Whoa. which is much larger than the exclusion zone, yeah. 10 miles. Ugh. The blast reached temperatures of 660 degrees Fahrenheit or 350 degrees Celsius. Whoa. And travels uh, and travelled at speeds of up to 300 miles or 500 kilometres per hour. Holy so shit. So basically in the blink of an eye it just went bang. So it's so people who are like, it's fine, I'll just outrun it. Impossible. Never going to happen. Of course. That's crazy. How fast was it moving again, sorry? Up to 500 kilometres per hour. What? Did Harry get to his boat? How fast do planes go? Oh. If you're in a plane, you could outrun it, like a, a jet. Hmm. Like a... Good If you're know. in a plane, you could outrun it. You'd have to be on the plane, running. at the back of the plane, running from the back of the aisle to the front. Whilst while the, the plane is also moving fast. <laughs> so really, the plane has done a lot of, a lot of heavy lifting. <laughs> but still, but it's good to get in some cardio. Technically, I have outrun a volcano. Was on a plane. Wow. Uh, the eruption had the energy of the equivalent of 1,500 of the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima. Oh, my God. The equivalent of 1,500 atomic bombs. Yeah, that's how much energy was released in that Whoa. instant. Whoa. And just like, it was instant, right? Like, it's just... Yep. Fuck. It Wait, was... I don't understand. But that's not going to be the same. It's not going to do as much damage because it's not radiation and stuff. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, there's no radiation involved here, luckily. But it was simply put amazing. Rocks and superheated gas flew across the air and down the mountain, destroying anything unlucky enough to get in their path. 1,300 feet of mountain disappeared almost instantly. In seconds, it was 1,300 feet shorter than it was a few seconds earlier. Whoa! It was crazy. Within minutes, uh, uh, piles of ash spread 15 miles high. Shit! 15 miles high. Which, quoting from the Smithsonian doco, um, which I will link to below, uh, which was fantastic. It was called, and you can watch it for free on Facebook. It was on the Smithsonian channel called Make It Out Alive, Mount St. Helens. Wow, cool. Wow. Sounds interesting. I just looked it up. Dante's Peak is based on this expo- this eruption. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, cool. there you go. Luckily, I haven't mentioned any grandma characters, so I won't be spoiling the movie. <laughs> you... <sighs> Uh, yeah, quoting, we have. Uh, quoting from that doco, which is uh, that 15 miles high, is that that's more than twice as high as commercial planes fly. That's how high the ash went into the air. It choked the air and caused the sky to go dark. If you were around the mountain this time, breathing became very, very difficult. Oh, man. So, like, all of a sudden, it's dark. It just went really, really dark, and suddenly the ash is hot. If you're unlucky enough to be close enough for it to fall on you, it will burn you, and you can't breathe. Oh, I was feeling nervous for all the people you've mentioned. Now I'm feeling pretty scared. Okay. Um, that ash, there was so much ash, it would go on to circle the globe twice. What? That's how well, I like a tour. Yeah. Bloody so hell. People tour. paid tickets to see it. See ash. Yeah. It was the, the 80s. Irish band. <laughs> <laughs> it was the 80s. It was a different time. Different time. People used to come out to see ash. <laughs> Poor old ash. They're a good band. I never heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to Ash? I've never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you want to know what happened to the people inside? I've got yes. some good news and I've got some bad news. Okay. All right. Okay. Predictions. I was going to predict, but that seems like a okay, fucked thing to do. Morbid, yeah, it? it is. But the old man's dead for sure. He's who I'm going to start with. Sorry to say, Harry Truman. Sorry, let me just take a sip of water because I'm. Oh my god. Got a lot of information to deliver to you. The the suspense is killing me. So he's lived there for fifty years. He's World War One veteran. He's the one. He's that refused to leave. He reckons he's going to get in his boat. Let's find out. The landslide headed straight for Spirit Lake, where Harry Truman lived. He was lived, thank God. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my gosh. Thank you. He was still inside his cabin when it erupted. He simply didn't stand a chance. 
both he and the lodge disappeared under hundreds of feet of ash, just buried. It's been estimated he had only 22 seconds between the start of the eruption and the landslide hitting him. There's a, a great doco, Make It Out Alive, by the Smithsonian, which, I, again, I'll link to below. Um, in it, they interview one of his neighbours who did leave called Mark Smith. And uh, looking back, he says this is a quite a poignant quote. He says, quote, A lot of people think, gee, that was quick, talking about the 22 seconds. Mm. And he says, well, if you stop right now and count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, by the time you get to 22, that's a hell of a long time to see your life pass before you. Yeah. Because he would have heard the explosion, gone out, seen what's going on. You got 22 seconds before it engulfs you in your house. Uh. Sadly, Harry's body was never found. Well, the only thing you could hope for then would be like a, a... Quick death, quick and painless. Yeah, yeah, you know it would be it would be over very quickly. Th- I mean, that's an awful silver lining, but you know you where you assume. find me in a door frame because that's where supposedly the most. The I think that's earthquakes. that's earthquakes. That's earthquakes. Yeah, well, this Not, was triggered by one. Yeah, but the volcano part. Oh yeah. Well, let me finish. My door, uh, my doorway is mm-hmm. also molten proof. Oh, okay. You didn't. Sorry, you didn't mention that. Multiple I didn't let you proof. finish. Yeah. That's, that was on me. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, can I come over in the yeah. instance of a volcano? You have 22 seconds to get to Matt's house. <laughs> Easy. I've got room for three people under there. Wonderful. So Thank you. So, yeah, you can come around and bring a friend. <laughs> okay, great. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> You're dead. <laughs> oh, no, don't. No, don't Dave's probably right. holidaying on some sort of yeah. a prizey one online. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> He's probably eating a pie He'll on, miss on it. the top of a, yeah. like a dormant... Volcano Mountain. Am I a prize pig? Yeah. In all mm. the right ways. Thank you. I mean, you've won a prize for liking pies and a prize for eating a nacho. Yeah, but he was he entered the competition. I'm not what hang on. I'm not having a go. I'm just saying it's I amazing. Attacked. I feel attacked. Oh no, I was saying like you gotta be in it to win it. Yeah, no, thank you. Yes. No, I was attacked by Matt, not you. You were defending me, I appreciate I that. I was not attacking. I was saying it's amazing. <laughs> It's crazy. It is. It's silly. It, it is silly looking back. Um, sadly, Harry has died. Mm-hmm. Uh, Keith Ronholm, he's the geophysics student that's bluffed his way in. At the time of the eruption, he was quietly reading in his truck. He heard the huge eruption in Lazline and still in his underwear, grabbed his camera and just started shooting, taking incredible pictures of the massive blast cloud before realizing, hey, that's actually coming this way and very, very fast. He started to get dressed while still taking photos. Getting dressed, still taking photos, okay. He had to but deci- we know this story. That's a good sign. He had to decide in the blink of an eye, do I stay in shelter in the truck or leave and try to outrun the cloud? At the last possible moment, he decided to make a run for it. He jumped in his car and decided to just drive. He began to think, oh no, I've waited too long. I took Don't one- Don't get dressed. I've wa- don't get dressed. Don't... So he's putting on. He puts on pants, takes some more photos, puts no, on the shirt. No, get in the car. And that's what he's. He's already in the car. Just drive. He's driving, and he's thinking, I've, "I really regret that photo." <laughs> kind of like when we missed the plane the other day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should not have taken that piss. Should not have bought a magnet. Oh, should not have pissed on that magnet. <laughs> yeah, it was weird that you did that. A similar life and death scenario. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whilst driving down a dirt road, he looked back over his shoulder one last time, and he took a photo. Stop it! Driving. Stop taking. Photos. You dickhead. But we've seen these photos apparently. I'm feeling good about this one. It's an incredible photo. It shows a giant wave of ash gaining on him and smashing everything in his path. That's a powerful photo. It's really, really is. The cloud overtook his vehicle and suddenly everything went completely dark. So the ash had caught up with him. Even with the headlights on, he couldn't see the road in front of him. So to avoid an accident, he pulled over. He just had to wait it out. The whole time wondering, am I going to be buried alive by ash? Or have I made it far enough away that it's just going to be like a foot of ash and that when it calms down, I'll be able to drive again. But he's thinking, if it's like 10 feet of ash, I'm going to die in this car. Wow. So what is ash? I think if ash is being a thing, you just like, you know, just shuff off. Shuff off. No, well, because <laughs> when it comes shuff out, off ash. it's like very, very hot. Yeah. And there's also gas in the air, so it's very difficult to breathe in, and you can't see anything, so it's a horrible situation to be in. As he stayed in his truck, he saw a glow coming up behind him. Oh, my Uh, God. He started to panic. He's thinking, holy shit, that's lava. I'm about to get melted. But as it got closer and closer, he realized it was the headlights of another car. 
Two people were on each side of the front of the vehicle and were giving directions to the third person as they drove. Oh, smart. Because in the car, you can't see anything. But if you're out, you can see a little bit. You can see about maybe a foot or two feet in front of you. Right. So they're crawling along and they're just feeling their way. So he can follow them. And they're yelling out, turn left, turn right, that kind of thing, crawling out. Getting their slipstream. They happened upon Keith in his car and he joined the others and they very, very slowly headed back towards oh, he town. Oh, got in their car. That makes yeah. it even more but sense. Wouldn't it be hard to... It's hard to breathe. It's very hard to breathe. Fuck. So, yeah. You do not want to be an asth- asthmatic in this situation. Uh, this chance encounter turned out to save Keith's life. Wow. If he'd stayed put, he would have died in that truck. Whoa. Only later did he realise that people much further away lost their lives that day. And if he'd stayed put, he would have been another victim. Holy shit. Just those people were driving along and they gave him a lift. So... Keith survived. Whew. So many, like, spur of the moment, life or death decisions to make. Crazy. Staying or going, that sort of stuff. So, he just kept making the right decision. Although, stopping eventually was wrong, but it ended up... Yeah, yeah. that's right. Because, I mean, if he kept driving, in theory, he probably would have crashed. Cliff or something, and yeah. then he'd be stuck. Uh, so, he's alive. Reed Blackburn, the photographer working for the newspaper and National Geographic, started taking photos when it started erupting. And even took the time to write down times and shot numbers in his log. So I guess back in the day, what you do, you take a photo, wind it on, and then you'd write down a description of the photo so it's easier to catalogue later. This is what he's doing while he's in the danger zone? Yeah. A, a, a volcano is erupting and he's taking time to do that. He's a real professional, but this cost him valuable time. And unlike Keith Ronholm, he didn't actually have time to start driving at all. So by the time he got to his car, he just wound the windows up and hoped for the best. Sadly, the ash was just too much and he was just way too close. The following day, his car was discovered, buried up to the windows in ash, with Reed's body still in the front seat. He died of asphyxiation. Fuck. His notebook that recorded the photos survived and gave an indication of his last moments. Sadly, his photos didn't survive. Oh. So, so you could, the they, they could tell kind of what time he died because of what yeah. he'd, cause he'd written, you know. Eight for thirty-four description. But if he didn't take those photos and log it, he just yeah. Some of these people are so dedicated to their gigs. Well, you may have got away again. Most of them, I've never experienced a volcano. You don't know. You're miles and miles away. You don't realize how quickly it yeah, can just so change quick. in a second. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Robert Landsberg, our other photographer, was also way too close to the blast. As the cloud of ash and hot rocks bore down upon him, Landsberg, realizing he had no means of escape. Just kept taking photos until the last possible moment. He then wound the film back into its case, placed the film into his camera, into his backpack, and then laid himself on top of the backpack oh my God. in an attempt to protect its contents. Incredibly, his sacrifice worked. What? His body was found buried in the ash with his backpack underneath 17 days later. And whilst the photos were slightly damaged, they did survive and were later published in National Geographic. Amazing. Whoa. So it's his final moments. I, imagine that moment realizing I'm going to die here. I Just keep in taking photos. This is the best I can do. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. Because you'd think, well, who knows what you'd think, but I imagine some people would be like, I'm going to die. Fuck everything. Yeah, or just panic. Yeah, or panic. Stand there going, what, what, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And but it's it all just over. sounds like he's so calmly yep. went, well, I'm gone, but I want to leave something behind. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, and I'll be posting lots and lots of photos of the eruption. There's so many good ones, but I'll I'll be taking the one. I'll, I'll definitely post Keith's photo of him turning around in the yeah. in the truck, and also some of Robert's ones, which you know are amazing. They are damaged, but like that sort of adds to it because you realise this man died taking these photos. Wow, absolutely amazing. Uh, David Johnston, our volcanologist, was just six miles away from the, the summit when it erupted. The pyroclastic flow, which I've watched... I remember watching documentaries on volcanoes with my dad as a kid. That's the thing you got to be most scared of in an eruption. It's um, fast-moving currents of hot gas and volcanic matter. And it just travels at hundreds of miles per hour down the mountain and just smashes everything in its path. Right. And it can't breathe and it's super hot and it just destroys everything. So people worry about the lava, but that sort of comes a bit later usually and it's a, bit, it's a lot slower. Yeah. A lot of the time you can sort of outrun or outdrive lava, but the pyroclastic flow, if you're in its path, you have no chance. Right. Wow. So that's the most terrifying is part. It, this is one of the guys who knew this was or believed this was all going to happen. Yeah, this is the yeah. main guy. Still ended up being so, so close. He's there because remember I said before, he because re- he's monitoring it for everyone, he realised that 
sometimes scientists have to put themselves in danger to protect other people by reporting on what's going on. Uh, it would have only taken f- one minute for the pyroclastic flow to reach where David was. In that time, he was able to reach a radio and send a message to his colleagues. His final words were, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. Wow. It was unclear at first if he had survived, but it was soon discovered that the area he'd been in was absolutely decimated. The lateral blast that killed Johnston started at a speed of 220 miles or 350 kilometers per hour and accelerated to 670 or, 12, uh, or 1,080 kilometers per hour. Holy shit. And sadly, his body was just never recovered. What? I, it's, um, yeah, so if, if everyone believed him and they made a huge exclusion zone, would he still, do you reckon he still would have stayed in there to monitor it? Probably just because he was monitoring it every single day. Well, rem- and remember, so he, the thing that he's predicted has killed him, but also, tragically for his colleague and his mentee, mm. he had taken it over his friend's shift that day. Remember, he wasn't right. even supposed to be yeah. there. Uh, his apprentice, Harry Glicken, uh, was completely distraught after the loss, I bet. as he would be. Yeah, you're yeah, blaming he'd... yourself. Yeah. And, uh, but, I mean, you, obviously that's not logical. No, it could have no. gone at any second. In a cruel twist of fate, Glicken was also killed by an eruption at Mount Unsen in Japan in 1991. This makes Glicken and his mentor Johnson the only two US volcanologists to ever be killed by volcanic eruptions. They're the only two. The only two. Oh, wow. I, I, that's like a, that feels like a curse. Isn't that uh, crazy? So you'd feel guilty this whole time. I was supposed to be there. I should have been killed by that volcano. Then 11 years later, he becomes the only second ever US volcanologist to get killed by one. Right. That's like, what's that movies that... A horror movie series where the death would always come oh, from. Oh, Final Destination. Final Destination. Yeah. Couldn't live it. So, sadly, David Johnston is uh, is uh, one of the victims. So, uh, so far we've had one survivor. We've had one survivor. Mentioned. And so much luck. So much luck to yeah. get there. <clears throat> wow. I'm going to tell you another about another person I haven't mentioned before. It wasn't just people in the exclusion zone that were affected. 36-year-old Jim Shimanke was working as part of a team of four members of a logging crew because it's surrounded by forest there. And that w- actually people did kick up a fuss later on saying one of the reasons they thought the exclusion zone wasn't larger is that it was a big logging area. And some people said did th- a, a possible group. reason, yeah, that oh, that would have stopped the logging. Right. Which would have cost, you know, millions of dollars potentially. Mm. So they just went, nah, don't worry about it. Keep the logging going. That was a criticism afterwards. But Jim Shimanke was there with three other people. The crew were logging 12 miles from the mountain and were outside the red exclusion zone when it erupted. He was far enough away that when it first kicked off, he and his two colleagues with their chainsaws had no idea. They just kept logging until their fourth colleague, who had refused to work on Sundays, he was just camping, came running down towards them. Then the blast hit and the men were just knocked to the ground. The ash began to fall and it was so hot it melted Jim's gloves onto his hands. What? What? How, how gross is that? So, like, proper workman's gloves melted onto his hands. Still on the ground being after being knocked over, the ash started piling on top of him and his colleagues and it was burning their skin. Oh, my God. His lungs were also burning from breathing it in. It was so hot, his first thought was, oh, my God, I'm being covered in lava. Oh, right. shit. He felt like he was on fire. Incredibly, tough man, he was able to get up despite the pain. Oh, my God. It was almost completely black and difficult to see, but he was able to find his three colleagues and they too were alive, but only just. They tried to seek relief from the burns by heading down to a river that usually runs cold, but uh, it had turned into grey muck because all the ash. Yeah. yeah. And then and then later on, mud flows actually took over. It was an awful situation. Now, uh, next, they soon uh, uh, sought shelter in their logging truck, which had been moved by the blast but remained upright. The four squeezed into the cab, increasing the pain from their burns as they rubbed against each other. Oh. Finally, they could bear it no longer. They knew if they were to survive, they're going to have to walk out themselves. But everywhere they looked was destruction. Logs blocked every path. They they split the party into two. We know never sometimes. split the party. You never do one, that. One split is never, not going to survive. Ever here. split the party. And uh, Jim and uh, one man went off in one direction. The other two went in another. Despite their burns, they walked 4.5 miles before Jim and wow. his friend's path was completely blocked by a landslide. They had nowhere to go. Burnt and exhausted, they lay down defeated. 
They could hear co- helicopters from the National Guard overhead, but the copters couldn't see them through the through the ash. So basically, they lay there for hours. Oh my god, no! Jim um, would later say, ah. "Balling too much," that he basically wondered, "How long is this going to take?" Preparing for death, yeah. sort of hoping that it would. Can we speed this up? I'm yeah, in a lot of pain. A quick death. Their lungs were burnt. Their skin was burnt. They had no energy, but they refused to die. And then they heard a helicopter, this time much closer than the others. Jim looked up and he could see it. He barely had enough strength to lift his arm to signal it, but he did. The helicopter tried to land, but the ash made that a very difficult task and also blew more into ash into oh, Jim's face. Fuck <laughs> the closer sake. it gets, the more ash kicks up. Yeah. Eventually, the pilot, bit of a hero, was able to land and Jim and his colleague were rescued. He spent months in the hospital and survived... Whereas sadly, the other three men, including the other man rescued, did not wow. succumb to their injuries. Yeah, I think um, two of the other men, they tried to make it through a, a flooded area and just sort of never never able to get through it. And the other man just succumbed to his injuries, the burns and everything of else. Of course. Uh, Jim never logged again and instead began restoring antique cars. Oh, cool. Wow. So, and he's been interviewed uh, multiple times since. About far out. Those would be just the most horrendous injuries to oh, man. recover from. Yeah, but that's uh, he survived. So amazing, crazy survival story. And there's lots of other stories about that. I've just sifted a few, a few of them. Mm. Uh, the effects of the eruption were felt across America and the world. Complete darkness occurred in Spokane, Washington, which was 250 miles or 400 kilometers northeast of the volcano. Wow. So 400 k away, the ash is so thick, it's it's turned to nightfall. Within minutes, a pile of ash uh, spread 15 miles high, which I said before. The ash would circle the globe twice, which I did mention earlier, but that is just crazy that it would just... It, you know, in Australia, we were detecting ash in the air. Like, crazy. Maybe not people... like. Um, it's not like when we have a bushfire and you can smell it, but instrumentation from scientists, they could right. sense that there was ash in the air. It's like in Chernobyl. They could detect the radiation. Oh, yeah, that's right. They detected it eight, ages away. Uh, the eruption also melted entire glaciers in the area. Whoa. Which is Melting a glacier? No, they take, you know, millennia to form. It just, just melts it. They're gone in minutes because they're right next to the volcano and then hot ash just lands on it and, just go, and, it, just at, and uh, it melts. And these cause lahars or volcanic mudslides, which cause further destruction. Oh, that so sucks. The, so the, the water melted, caused a flood. It combined with all the ash and the, and the dirt and gross... Uh, mudslide started. The thermal energy released during the eruption was the equivalent of 26 megatons of TNT, and the eruption caused over one billion dollars in damage, oh. equivalent of 3.3 billion today. That's so much. And that's US dollars too. So it's five trillion Australian. Oh. <laughs> Quick yeah. maths. Well done. That's <laughs> a lot of scamolians. Yeah. Which is like a, I think a phrase for money. Mm. So, I, t- I mentioned it was a logging area. Mm. Four billion feet of board or 9.4 uh, million square metres of timber was destroyed, which is enough to build about 300,200 bedroom homes. Oh. And the ash removal took months in some places. Wait, sorry. Read that again. 300,000... Two bedroom homes worth of wood was yeah. just wiped out in seconds. Far out. In the forest I around. I heard it as 200 bedroom homes and I was like, Whoa. Whoa. Dude, that's like, that's huge. That's a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but how many hotels? <laughs> uh, before the eruption, the mountain peak was 9,677 feet or 2,950 metres. But afterwards, it was 8,363 feet or 2,549 metres, meaning it lost 1,300 feet or 400 metres of height. Wow. And there are photos that compare the before and after and it looks like a different mountain. Really? That's crazy. But the official death toll of the eruption is recorded as 57. Oh. And the eruption has often been declared as the most disastrous volcanic eruption in US history. People say, without the exclusion zone, it could have been a lot worse. Yeah. But if the exclusion zone was a bit bigger, it would have been a lot less. I mean, 57 right. feels like a relatively low number, but that's still a lot of people. Yeah, it is. And for the destruction that it caused. Yeah. You know, it... Could have been... Could have been worse. worse. In 1982, uh, President Ronald Reagan announced that the area around the mountain would become the Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument, and inside the monument area, the environment is left to respond naturally to the eruption. Okay. So they didn't 
they didn't repair any of the or clear away any of the ash there. They just right. left it. Just left it to sort of nature take its course. An observatory was set up four miles from the mountain near where David Johnston was on the morning of the eruption and it was named the Johnston Ridge Observatory and named in his honour. Wow. Just finally, don't want to spook anyone here, but the volcano is still active and has had some uh, small eruptions since, leading me to ask, is it just another time bomb that will again explode in hundreds or thousands of years? Probably, Probably yeah. 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 Probably, totally. yeah. Totally. I just hope that I'm nowhere near it when it goes off. Far out. Because I'm fascinated by volcanoes. I, Like I said, w- would watch those dockers with my dad as a kid and, you know, watching the lava bubble afterwards and f- sort of form new islands yeah. and mountains. It's, it's so fascinating, but they are terrifying. Yeah. Just the speed and the power. Yeah. It's so scary. And there's, pr- there's stories of other people where they were camping out and they were closer than other people that died, but because of where they were and where the land was, when the the uh, blast came down the hill, it sort of went into a channel down a valley and they were standing on a slightly elevated bit. So it sort of was coming towards them and at the last second veered away. Far out. But if they'd been in any other spot, they would have been killed in seconds. Oh. So there's so many stories like that. Incredible. Far out. You you know what like the guy who survived and then spent the rest of his life just not just but like restoring antique cars it would sort of give you quite a bit of perspective wouldn't it Yeah yeah absolutely you've been that close like he was lying there prepared to die Yeah he's waiting he kn- for death He th- knew he was going to die not knowing I like not just thinking he thought he knew this is it Far out and that, the helicopter saving him was against all odds That's crazy Yeah just being able to see him let alone being able to get to him Quite amazing. But that's uh, that's the story of uh, the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. Dave, fantastic report. Great report, Dave. A fascinating story. Thank you. I do Brutal, love... Brutal, but fascinating. Yes, I do love a disaster story. Yeah, why is that? I, know, I find I do I find them fascinating, absolutely, yeah. And there is, a, you know, always the human element. It's just like the serial killer stuff when we talk about it here. Yeah. You know? it's, it is awful. These are real people, but... You know, I do find it fascinating. And the build-up, the lead-up to it, and there's always moments looking back where it could have been like, if we'd done this, we would have saved these. Mm. Still, you know, there's one thing that's smart to think about these and learn, to hopefully learn the lessons from Learn them. the lessons and just always err on the side of caution. Yeah, exactly. Um, That that was a, a huge report. It really, uh, yeah, that was full on. I don't know if I'm feeling particularly, particularly fragile or something, but I was like... Towards the end there, that was uh, that was something. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, I tried to finish with a man's heroic survival just to sort of no, yeah. pick it up at the end there, but it is um, really you know, sad, tragic that for those 57 people. Yeah, but I think, um, yeah, yeah, you can... It's not the kind of story I would uh, look into naturally, so it's, I appreciate you doing that. Mm. For here, us, that do go on. That's the right. show we're doing right now. Hey, Dave. On another different note, uh, the people who help make this show possible are our Patreons, and they support us at patreon.com slash do go on pod. Yes, and we love those people. We love them with all of our hearts. Absolutely. They and make this show, as you say, possible and make our lives a lot better. And uh, one of the rewards you can get if you sign up there at patreon.com slash do go on pod on the Sydney Scheinberg Deluxe Memorial VIP RIP, RIP. edition. Uh, as you get uh, to give us a fact, a quote, or a question, there are also other um, great rewards like bonus episodes and other such things, shout outs and, and whatnot. In the fact, quote, or question section, you get to do any of these, uh, any number of things. Three. <laughs> any number of things. Fact, quote, question. Boom. And this week, uh, we've got a couple. One is a fact from Nathan. And Nathan has given himself the title, because you have to give yourself a title as well in this section. He's given himself the title of Chief Beverage Analyst Officer. Interesting. Okay. Nathan, I like it. Interesting. That is a fascinating title to have given yourself. Thank you so much, Nathan. And your fact that you've given us is, it's geez, it's brief. I love that. Right to the point. You ready for this? Yes. Take it all in if you can. The medical name for your butt crack (laughs) is... Intergluteal cleft. <laughs> that oh, makes sense. I've never heard that. Makes I've sense. never heard that either. Me Intergluteal either. cleft. It does make sense. For your butt crack. That's a beautiful fact. Thank so you so, succinct. so much. Thank and you, one Nathan. more time for his job title. Chief Beverage Analyst Officer. Thank you so much. Does that mean you'll bring us beverages? Yeah, and that, well, yeah, is he analysing the ones that we already have? Oh, okay. Mm. Making sure they're not poisoned? 
Oh, that's great. Your Thank taste you. tester. Yes, that's right. He goes, no, all good. Then hands you the drink. Yeah, I like that. He has to wait a few days to make sure there wasn't anything wrong with it. Yeah, he tastes our drink several days ahead. Um, we're always having three-day-old milk. He anticipates <laughs> our, our wants. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Nathan. And also, I would love to thank Odie Matthews, who's given himself the title of Junior Vice President of Coming Back to the Patron. <laughs> he basically left for a little period. <laughs> but he's back. Bigger, badder, better than ever. Odie. And Odie has asked a question, and I probably mention this every time, but I don't read them until I read them. So I think I nailed that last one. That was great. It basically had Latin in it, and I, I didn't even stumble. But Odie asks... Since y'all, he's American, I think. Mm. Since y'all have done so many different reports, I was wondering if there were any from the beginning of the pod that you wish you could do again with new information and skills on writing reports. That's a great question. That yeah. is a good question, Odie. Yeah, that is. That's an interesting one. I think. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the earlier reports I did. Yeah, a lot of the early ones. I think we were figuring it out. I think there's some topics I just wouldn't choose now. Like I wouldn't do. The hottest one hundred now. It's a it's kind of a, quite a strange. Okay. And it's also because it's it's just all instantly out of date. Yeah. Because it you know I did that in twenty fifteen. Yeah, yeah. It's been four of those countdowns since then. Yeah. I mean Can't maybe the, hit, the if it was I should have just had done the origin of it, which is probably what I did. I can't even remember. Um. But yeah, I'd I'd probably love to do every report I've ever done again. I feel like I could always do them better. Yeah, you could always improve. You personally. Um, yep. Dave and I have always nailed it. Yeah, I feel like I've always nailed it. No, I think I could do the Beatles better. Left-handedness, I don't know if I would have done that. Uh, yeah. I think that was a... I quite like that as a report. Yeah, I find that. I, I like think those it's cool. sort of ones. Yeah, it's different. Yeah, it's not just like a... Thi- you know, it's not the, uh, an event or a person. It's yeah, like, I like some of those ones that are yeah. just... Uh, yeah, almost answering a question. What's the deal with left hand? Yeah. yeah. Or how do tattoos work? Yeah. Kind of yeah, I forgot we'd done that. That's, uh, I think... Yeah, that's probably one that I would like to do again. Right. Maybe we could now do updates. Um, but yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Yeah, great question. I should go back through some of the older episodes and don't put yourself through that. No, that's a good point. <laughs> I d- did um, talk to someone at a recent live show who said they've just gone back to the start and they're starting again. They said they just listened to the Spice Girls episode. I said, "All right, my favorite Spice Girls, scary. Is that still true?" And she said, "It is." <laughs> Woo-hoo. And I said, and Dave's, no, Jess's was Sporty Spice. No, Dave's was Sporty Spice. Sporty. And Jess's was Posh. Was no, Baby. Baby. Damn it. So it's close. It's not a Spice. Baby. Did I do that report? One of you did. Or did I? <laughs> oh, it, would, it wasn't me. It could have. Maybe it was me. No, it was you. Probably no, it was me. you. Probably yeah, it was me. Yes. Yeah, sp- spice up your life. Go back and listen to that one again. <laughs> Um, thank you so much to Odie for that question. Thanks, Odie. Thanks, Odie. Good Dave, question. you didn't. Did you give an answer there? Um, I'm just. Try, I'm sure there's ones that I'm like. Oh, I wish I'd done. I could do that again. I but think Ab- Agrippina the Younger was one that I think I could have done more coherently. Oh, I've just heard the some names. Some people say that it was a bit, a bit hard to follow at times. Mm, I wish that I could go back and. Uh, be funnier on the Helen Keller episode. <laughs> oh, that is one. Yeah, that's... Because Matt and I sort of treated that with sort of... I think too much we were treating it with kid gloves. Too worried to make jokes. But later on we've discovered, obviously, uh, you can find humour around. We're not... We, I think we're worried that we'd be look like we were making fun of Helen Keller. Exactly. A remarkable person. But we could have had more fun, I reckon, around the topic. But I think we were a little too nervous at the time. Yeah, we missed we missed the start and never caught up. Yeah, and that was a good report by you, Jess, but it was sort of, it really should be our job to chime in with sillier things that don't make fun I know. of. And I was almost about to say that maybe that wasn't the best topic choice, but she's a fascinating person. Oh, absolutely. It's an incredible life. It's a great story. And we've, yeah, we're like we're, there's been all sorts of stories yeah. that might seem inappropriate to... Yeah, yeah, but that's face like, value. yeah. That's I mean, that's the delicate thing that we try and do. There's, do you know what though? We could go back and do some that we've done three years ago, and it wouldn't even feel like we were redoing it because I've forgotten it all. Yeah, I'd be hearing it for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, really? I'd probably make oh. the same jokes I made the first time because my brain has not evolved. 
<laughs> that is true. <laughs> It's a good question, Odie. As a brain scientist, oh no, that's not true. As a brain scientist. Brain scientist. Brain. Another thing we <laughs> like to do is thank a few of our other Patreons, and Justin we comes up with a bit of a game. Yeah, a bit of a tough one with this topic. Mm, so disasters, volcano. Either we can name a volcano after them. <laughs> oh yeah. Or or because you know how they named that sort of uh, that area after David Johnston, Johnson, mm. Johnston, Johnson, yep, Johnston, Johnston. Maybe we could name some sort of uh, monument after them. Oh, okay. Great. You know what I mean? Is it ex- no. Uh, all right. And uh, what, so we can go through statues or that. Yeah. All sorts of things. Yep. What do you reckon? Heaps I like this. options. Yeah, great. So, kicking off, uh, I'd love to thank, if possible, from Bandhagen in SE. Would that be Sweden? Yeah, that is. I'd love to thank Emil Litwin. Emily Litwin. Emily Litwin. Emily Litwin. Yeah, that's okay. right. Thank you so much for listening all the way over in Sweden, which I say all the way over. It's not that far from us right now, is it? Oh, yeah. We're still thinking like we're in Australia. I always think like we are. Sometimes we say stuff like, yeah, over here, and you go, oh, no, we meant over there, Australia. Yeah. <laughs> and She's I already got Win in her name. So that's okay. A, so there's a monument ready to go. What? Uh, Litwin. So it's a, a, you know, you'd think... That's like some sort of a book prize, a lit win. Yes. So I think it's like like a Ruknama style massive book monument. Uh, f- for maybe for and it's it's remembering uh, people who read a full book in one year, which I'm yet to do, but um, everyone who does and they get their name etched on the bottom. Yes, if I'm they, on there. If they only read one, Wait, if they no, surpass I'm- one. What I've, re- I've read I've read a book in a year. Let's make it something that I haven't done. Something for me to two books for. in a year. Two books in a year. <laughs> <laughs> I think no. I reckon I've even done that. I, let's say if, uh, let's say ten books in one year. I would never have done that. Not like novels. I would have read you know ten picture books when I was a kid probably. Sure. Where's Wally? Where's Wally two? Mm-hmm. Where's Wally now? Where's Wally? Where the fuck is that guy? I've read all those. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, is that anything for Emily, Emily Lickwin? Yes, I reckon it is. From Bandhagen, Sweden. Bandhagen. That's so cool. It's so cool that we've got a listener in Sweden. And awesome. I know actually quite a few listeners in Sweden, which is wild. It's awesome. It's very cool. Thank you so much, Emily. And that makes me feel real cool. Thanks, Emily. Um, I'd also love to thank from San Diego in California, oh. United States of America, Aaron Stosel. Aaron Stosel. Aaron Stosel. And the Aaron Stosel observation deck. Okay. Oh, wow. What is he observing? Over a big cliff. Whoa. Whoa. And people bungee jump off it. Really? Oh, and cool. you can watch from the from the observation deck. You can observe from the Aaron Stosel observation deck to see people jumping and then bouncing back. Yeah, it's really fun. Because that's what he did. Aaron, he, he hit some tough times, but he always bounced back. Always bounced back. And that was why it was a beautiful and apt dedication to him. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Do you want to thank some? I'd love to thank some of these beautiful Patreon supporters. Now, I would like to thank from an unknown address. <laughs> Ooh, mystery Ooh, man. Ooh, I love the mystery here. First name, Frank. Oh. Last name, West. Oh, that's a great name. Frank West. That's a Hollywood name. I think that we should dedicate a monument on a mystery island to him. Oh. Yes. So he can never find it. Yeah, but... No one can. No one can. Oh, but we definitely made one. We definitely made one, but yeah, you'll never find there's it. There's a photo of us standing next to the monument, which we'll, se- which we'll email it. him. We've got his email, that's about it. Okay. Frank West. And uh, I believe it, it's a giant question mark, because this is the mystery man. Yes. And what does it... What, what does it represent? Mystery... Intrigue. Oh, intrigue. It's just like you get a monument for being most intriguing. Oh, okay. And how about we bury treasure at the foot of the question mark? So if you are able to find this mystery island and dig it up, the treasure's yours. And, and you'll need to Frank follow these donated? questions three. No, we've just dedicated it to Frank. It's, oh. it's coming out of our pocket. Okay. Because we, we appreciate his support so much. It's going to cost us many millions more dollars than he's donated to us. But uh, hey, That's the price you pay. Thank you, Frank West, the mystery man. Who knows where you're from? Who knows? I'm predicting Mozambique. Oh, Mozambique. That's my hot tip. 
All right. I would like to thank... Now, I've got the uh, location of the next person. They are in Tempe, Arizona. I would like to thank Andrew Jacob Greenfield. Oh. Mm. Greenfeld. So sorry. I've added in an I there. Andrew Jacob Greenfeld. AJG. AJG. Oh. AJG. Okay. I'm trying to think. What are the, some other monuments you can have? What about an obsolisk? An What's obelisk? Obelisk. Which you pointed out one the other day when we were in uh, Dublin and also said it wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> an obsolisk. It's an obsolisk. I like adding extra letters in a word I vaguely remember. And is this like a classic Egyptian obelisk? You know, they often... European people would steal those and put it, there's one in Paris. Yeah. Standing up there. But this one, we're, we're building it from scratch, um, from from stone from the local Arizona area. Oh, great. Uh, local tribute. Yeah, local oh, tribute. that's nice. And it's, uh, it's a tribute to all of those people who've stood up for what they believe in. That's why it's an upright obsolete. Oh, that's good. Love that. And Andrew Jacob Grenfell's done that. He does that every day. He stands up for... What he believes in. And what he believes in sometimes is questionable. But that's not the point. The point is he, he stands you stand up. up. You're your right to believe in yeah. whatever you want. Andrew Jacob Greenfield, thank you so much. All the way from Tempe, Arizona. We appreciate you. I can see from there. Tempe, baby. That we, was a punchline or a joke that I cut from the show like this year. <laughs> Tempe, baby. <laughs> you should put that back in. That's I'll put good it back stuff. In. Maybe I'll use it next year. I'd also like to thank a little more local to home, but very far away from where we are right now, in Ballarat in Victoria. Ah, uh, the rat. The rat. That's where my grandparents live. I would like to it's thank... where Plugger was born. Sandy Ty. Oh, Sandy Ty. Hi, Sandy Ty. Sandy Ty, what an honour to be thanking you today. What? I didn't know you were from Ballarat. Me either. Um, and Sandy, uh, actually, the the monument that's named after her is a giant gold nugget. Oh. Because Ballarat was a gold mining, gold mining, gold, gold panning. Gold rushing town. Gold rushing town. Oh, built on the gold nugget's back. Yeah. And so they named a big nugget after her. Big gold one. It's oh, real it's gold. It's an actual big gold nugget. Yeah, yeah it's like the it's biggest like the one they've ever stranger. found. stranger. Or the goodbye friend. The Sandy Tie. The Sandy Tie. Big wow. nugget. It's the biggest nugget ever found. Biggest nugget ever found. It's we're actually as big as me. All we've got to do now is find it. What's some, what's some one of the other famous nuggets? Welcome Strangers one, right? That's the biggest one, yeah. Okay. Well, let's quit while we're at yeah, the top. Why yeah, why just name the biggest one? That's fine. And finally, bringing it home. Thanks, would, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. I would love to thank from Durham. Durham. Uh. Here in the greatest Britain, I'd love to thank Joshua Curry. Oh, that's a nice name, isn't it? Yeah, Josh Curry. Well, can I say for Josh, Yes. we're going to shoot something in a space, but what are we going to shoot in a space? Mm. Um, Assuming he's still alive, we can't shoot his ashes up there. Yeah. But maybe we can shoot like, we ro- re- maybe we record an episode about Durham. Yep. And all of the fan- fascinating facts about it. Dave, could you give us a couple of quick ones as an example? Oh, the weather there today is eight degrees. Yeah. So fascinating, fascinating stuff, stuff like that. that. A um, three star we'll hotel will average 52 pounds. Okay. It has a castle and a university botanical gardens. Yes, please. Interesting stuff only. Sorry about that. We put all of that onto a recording uh, into a language that the Martians will understand. Oh, shoot love it. it into space. Which definitely exists. Martians on Mars. I don't care what the propaganda machine tells you. We shoot in a space. Mm-hmm. And that is a beautiful tribute. Great. Don't you think? Yes. I think that is the tribute that I'd want. Yeah. It's got its own flag and coat of arms. That's Durham. not a bad flag, actually. It's a fine flag. Oh, it's sort of like the English... Uh, Icelandic flag. Huh? St. George's Cross, but with the back filled in with the, like a navy blue. It's a fine flag. It's a fine flag. Thank you so much, Josh. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. We thank, uh, we appreciate everyone that supports the show on Patreon. And you can do that one more time at patreon.com slash pod. Oh, yeah. Big time you can do that. And that brings us to the end of the show, Dave. Did yeah. you know that? Can't believe it. Wow. That We've done the report. By. Done the Patreon. Tick, tick. We're, we're good here. Thanks so much for everyone for tuning in yet again. If you want to find us online, we put stuff up on our social medias at Do Go On Pod on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And also at gmail.com if you want to get in touch on the email. Jess yeah. replies to you within sort of one hour up to, all the way up to like maybe two, three weeks. Yep, somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. So it can be real quick. So roll the dice. 
Uh, if you time it when she's on the computer, you might get a real yeah, quick Yeah, you might have nailed it. But she only gets on the computer every two or three weeks. And she is about to get the new version of The Sims. Yeah, so I won't be at so your emails. Good luck. Emails. Good luck. Uh, and yeah, what what else do they, people need to know? Oh shit, I was meant to plug my shows. I'm doing a show yes. in Hobart at uh, the Festival on the Edge of the World. Fringe on the End of the World. Fringe at the End of the World. Fringe at the End of the World. And that is on the 9th and 10th of January in Hobart, which is a, one of my favourite cities in the world in Tasmania. And you can find out details about that at mattstewartcomedy.com. And also in March, I think, I'm doing the Brisbane Comedy Festival again. And it's going to be real, real fun time. And in, I'm in an even bigger room than Amazing. that room that I was in in previous years. You weren't there, but everyone who was there would know that it was quite a sizey room. Whoa. And I'm in an even bigger room than that. And they can come along uh, to that. I think it's 10th to the 15th of March, I think. But there'll be details on the website, mattstewartcomedy.com. Sounds great. Fantastic. Well, um, guys, we've had some fun here in London tonight. But it's time for us to go out and get some nibbles. Yes. We are all very hungry. We always finish with a song. Jess, you want to kick us off? As we go on, we remember all the times we had together. Later. Bye. Bye. La 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 la. This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbroadcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. I mean, if you want. It's up to you.